I was just fell asleep and I heard the, the yell go up. And I came on to the deck and I wasn't there. I was still sleepy like and here I looked and there's nothing but white water breaking off the stern of the boat. Like, whales don't do that sort of thing. We've caught whales and we've caught large sharks and there's no chance at all of them towing you astern. Well, we were towing northeast and all of a sudden we started to go uh, southwest. The so opposite direction. Opened the engine up a bit, but so <laughs> we're making no headway at all. We're still going back. Willie Q. Kyle, James McClements, and Derek Cully have fished the Irish Sea all their lives, but recently their lives have been threatened by the kind of catch they'd rather do without submarines. The only thing we could have done would have been run the wires off and, and tried and got them cut right. What happens if you try and cut a wire? Is that dangerous? That's very dangerous. Uh, yes, I could cut you. It's very dangerous, right, with so much strain on, you know. Right? And then the wires that the boats use us now, they're, they're, the sting through them out of this world. Right? They're, Sounds very frightening to me. It's more than it was more, It wasn't as frightening at the time, but after, after it, right, and thinking about it, what the consequences could have been was, 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 was very, 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 very frightening. Right? And what sort of a distance were you towed for? Oh, well, we were only towed for about 10 minutes, right? Like, due to the fact that the shackle broke, broke on the wire, like, and we got away, you know, or he got away, I mean, we were very lucky. He started to tow us straight back, and then he started to shear all over the place, very violent, man, and uh, trying to shake us clear. And when eventually we were geared apart it, and uh, we were touched with the Coast Guard, and he told us to head for home and claim of the, the uh, Admiralty. He gave us address for Falls Lane, and uh, <clears throat> just as we were starting to steam, maybe 10 minutes, the submarine surfaced and called us back on RT to come back and help them to clear our gear. That must have been quite a surprise. That was. <laughs> but apparently, it materialised after that that we had, uh, we had holed him in the periscope tube and he was taking water and it had to come up. So he only came up because he was damaged, you think? That's right, aye. What did the submariner say when he surfaced? Did you speak to him? I did, I uh, was American and he told me that that was the largest, largest fish ever we would catch. And uh, like, he was quite arrogant about it. There were no apologies or nothing for the, what he had done. So much tension on the starboard work, we kept the boys all on the front side of the winch, clear of it. And I had the cutters ready to cut it if it came to a do or die situation. I cut it out of way. But we finally had to do that at the last, but the submarine had slowed up considerably by then and uh, finally got that cut. It sounds frightening to me. Oh, well, uh, at the time, uh, it was frightening after. At the time, there was no time to be frightened. It was all go, you know, talking to the shore station, the coast guards and that. After the dragging of the summer morn, there was embarrassing proof that a submarine had indeed pulled the boat for three hours. There, for all to see, was the submarine's secret communications boy. Thoughtfully enough, it decided to tell everyone where it had come from. Those were the experiences of three trawlermen from Porto Vogue here on the Strangford Peninsula. They're tough men, well accustomed to the dangers and rigours of offshore fishing. What they're not accustomed to is being dragged around the sea by submarines. But they got off quite lightly. There are other people who are lucky to be alive after their encounters with submarines. Tom Roberts from Ross Trevor is one. He was sailing his new yacht, the Five Field Five, across the Irish Sea from England in 1983, when the voyage came to an unplanned end in mid-sea. There was a sudden sharp crack, uh, which I thought was the fore hatch. Realised quickly it wasn't. Saw water coming in from forward. Realised that there must be a huge hold. It had come in so fast there must have been a huge hold, uh, for it was up above my ankles in seconds. And how, how long did it take for the boat to sink between the, oh, the crack and the... Um, a minute, minute and a half at the outside. It was only hours later when the Danish ship had picked me up and had fed me and dried me out. And the captain asked me had I had any ideas what had happened. And when he checked again my story, he said, well, I have little doubt about what happened to you. You've been hit by one of the submarines, which, are, uh, which there are very, very many uh, in this area. The most celebrated incident caused a diplomatic row between Ireland and Britain. Ray McAvoy from Tlochahead in County Louth was fishing aboard the Shirelga in 1982 when she was suddenly dragged backwards by a British submarine. We couldn't do nothing because uh, the longer it was going on, the faster the boat was getting towed backwards. And then all of a sudden she, she, she just got one pull 
on one side and she just capsized over. And what happened to you and the crew? Well, we were left scrambling on, on, on one side of the boat, trying to get up on one side of the boat, and I was trying to get out of the wheelhouse. And we all managed to get up on the side of the boat. She lied on her side for about two or three or four minutes or something, and then she eventually turned right round on her keel, and some of us had to get into the water at that stage. British submarines using the Irish Sea operate from this tranquil setting at Fast Lane on the Firth of Clyde. It's the hub of Britain's submarine defence strategy, employing 6,000 people. Four nuclear Polaris submarines slip silently from here into the Atlantic. Once launched, they never need refuelling. They're backed by 14 nuclear hunter-killers and older diesel-electric submarines. All of them use the Irish Sea. Just a few miles away at Holyloch, the Americans have been in residence since 1961. The Poseidon mooring pens low in the loch are home to number 14 submarine squadron. At least 10 nuclear Poseidons are based here, together with Lafayette-class submarines. The operational submarine forces which work out of the UK largely are based on the west coast of Scotland. The, uh, the tasks of the boats fall into two brackets. There are the, the missile submarines, which are offensive in character, and you have the attack submarines, whose job it is, amongst other things, to find enemy missile firing submarines and to sink them. There's constant submarine traffic in and out of the Holy Lock and Faslane bases. Once clear of the Firth of Clyde, there's only two ways a submarine can go. It can either head west for the open Atlantic, 32 million square miles for the unending game of hide and seek with the Russian submarines. Or there's the shortcut down through the Irish Sea for exercises further south in the Atlantic. For maximum security, that means following the deepest channel, the narrow Beaufort Dyke. And it's in this deep water that trawlers from Irish fishing ports are landing some of their best catches. Increasingly, they're getting entangled with the submarines below. The three Port of Vogue incidents happened in this area. The Shiralga was over the trench when she was dragged and sunk. Tom Roberts' yacht voyage ended here, also in the deep water zone. These are just five examples from a spate of incidents or alleged incidents involving submarines in recent years. David Evans spent many years serving in Oberon and nuclear Polaris submarines. He knows that trench well and has a healthy respect for the challenge it presents to submariners. Any confined water gives the submariner an increased challenge because he has two problems. He doesn't obviously want to run into anything, whether it's the bottom or a, a large chunk of rock like North Wales or anything else. So any confined water gives a navigational challenge. But of course, the crews of these submarines are very highly trained, very skilled, and um, can deal and cope with, with that problem without any difficulty at all. The other challenge that he has is a limited depth of water. And he doesn't want to run into the bottom, and he wants a certain amount of margin between him and what is a real danger to him. Some people have less faith in submariner's skills. Dick James represents fishermen's interests in Northern Ireland and is concerned at the level of submarine activity in this confined area. We're in a submarine alley and we've, we see not just evidence of submarine activity but we're used to seeing survey boats, uh, Admiralty survey boats working in that area of the Irish Sea that are very obviously uh, plotting submarine corridors. In the Irish Sea, because it's small and it's confined and uh, you've got irregular wave action and plus the biological sound, is known as a noisy sea and the submarines seem to use the noise as a screen to try and get lost from the uh, detecting apparatus, presumably the Russians, I don't know. So they tend to run out in packs, the um, big mother submarine, if you like, being screened by four, perhaps more, perhaps less, hunter killers which uh, run cover for it and also are themselves looking for perhaps Russian submarine activity. How do you know? You're talking as if you've seen all this happen. Well, we have. That uh, The day of the incident with the summer morn, um, somebody somewhere pressed a panic button and we had apparently five submarines pop up in the North Irish Sea. That would come as no surprise to one man here in Peel, just across Submarine Alley on the Isle of Man. So far, the island's fishermen have avoided the unwanted attentions of submarines. Nonetheless, the fishing port of Peel is the centre of a network of amateur sub-watchers. Bernard Moffat, a local trade union official and general secretary of the Celtic League, 
has organized a string of contacts to build up a picture of submarine activity despite official secrecy. Those sources can be, uh, and we're quite open about it, radio monitoring by scanner, which has proved to be very um, successful, and simply the monitoring of shipping movements from uh, shipping diaries and uh, media reports and so on. Over the six, seven year period, we've also built up a range of contacts with people at various points around the country, from uh, Faz Lane uh, to the south of England, the Republic of Ireland and so on. And we get a feedback of information from them. And remember, if there's military activity, it usually means there's a military exercise, which involves a degree of preparation, sometimes notification and so on. And it's fairly easy to keep tabs on the military. They'll be very um, perhaps aggrieved to hear that, but um, it is easy to do so. The Irish Sea has always provided a living for fishermen, and just now the living's good. When the fleet's in, harbours like Portavogie bristle with millions of pounds worth of gear. It's been fairly healthy over the recent past, the last three years. We've had a couple of, uh, I think, very good years in general terms. This winter has been very lean and we're looking forward with uh, some apprehension to the summer. We can see problems ahead of us. But generally the industry is in as strong of a situation as it's ever been, with more boats than we've had before, and everybody's getting a picking out of it anyway. We have about 200 boats uh, from County Down alone trawling, <clears throat> and as I say, 90% of them will be in the general sea area, in that general sea area. The vast majority of them do fish locally in the Irish Sea, with one or two boats which venture further afield, some out into the Atlantic, but only one or two. Um, I'd say over 90% of them confine their fishing activities to the Irish Sea. But uh, the most of them are fishing between the County Down coast and the coast of the Isle of Man. That's on the deep water channel? Well, there is a deep water channel there. That there's shallower water either side of that uh, deep water channel. But uh, the deep water channel is an area when the where the trawlers go to at certain times of tide and weather, um, where they can get a better picking out of that deep water channel than they would perhaps in the shallower water. When James McClements puts out from Port of Ogie with his crew, it's far from plain sailing, even when conditions are ideal. The Admiralty chart of the area shows that these days, the sea's a busy place. The bottom's littered with wrecks, obstructions and sandbanks. There are one-way shipping lanes, wartime explosive dumps and, not least, three submarine exercise areas. So when the crew shoot the nets over the stern, they have to know exactly where they're putting them. It's hard to appreciate the sheer size of a modern trawler's fishing nets. The one going out beside me is the size of a block of flats when it's fully unfurled and hauled by over 600 yards of heavy steel wire. Now if a submarine gets entangled in that, the crew have just two stark choices to make. They can either hang on and risk sinking, hoping the submarine will somehow free itself, or they can cut the net free and thus lose thousands of pounds worth of equipment. The trawl streams out from the stern, then when it's weighted, it sinks fast and the wires begin to take up the enormous strain. Down below, submarines are blind and have only sound to tell them what's where, and a confusing range of sounds in this noisy sea. Once you've got underwater and listen, it's quite fascinating. There are thousands of sounds of various sorts. Uh, whales make noises, shrimps make noises, ships make noises. Um, you can have seismic explosions from work going on in oil installations that carry long, long distances. Volcanic noises, thousands of different noises. What about nets, fishing nets? Do they make any sound at all? I personally don't believe they do. I think that uh, the net itself can't, moving through the water. But of course, there uh, is some ironmongery associated with the net. Um, bits and pieces of equipment to make the uh, net stream pro properly. And if that's clanking and clinking, yes, it is distinctly possible that it could be heard. The challenge in any sonar is, having heard it, how far away is it? So, uh, from your experience, mm -hmm. nets being trawled along in the water would present quite a considerable obstacle then? Well, certainly. I think it's a substantial challenge to a submarine, yes. I think it is probably one of the more difficult um, detection problems that any submarine would have. 
and it's that challenge that some submarines are failing. Having snagged a net, they'd certainly know about it. It is almost certainly to be the sounds of the nets, because these nets, after all, aren't made of uh, string and cordage, as we think. They're surrounded by fairly heavy wires, which actually tow them along. And wires scraping against the hull of the submarine would almost certainly uh, be obvious. And, of course, if there's a huge uh, weight on the end of it, the fishing boat itself, it would have uh, effect on the control of the submarine. So, in those circumstances, what options would be open to the submariner? That's very difficult indeed, and it obviously gives the, uh, the submariner a huge challenge at that time. Uh, an obvious thing, one could think, is to surface the submarine. That in itself raises a number of problems. He has to come uh, from deep, where he is safe, uh, back onto the surface, and he doesn't achieve too much if he comes up in front of another ship. Equally, you wouldn't want to come up underneath the trawler itself. So coming up is quite a delicate operation and uh, would give the, give the submariner a big, big problem. Uh, the other option is that the submarine shakes free, or the nets, of course, break, and, uh, and the submarine is then free of them. Francis Boyer served with distinction as a submarine commander. He's perplexed and dismayed by the string of incidents in the Irish Sea, but believes the stress of commanding a modern nuclear submarine may explain at least part of the problem. It may be due to what I would say uh, a psychological profile of commanding officers, particularly of boomers. I mean... That's nuclear submarine. The nu the, well, the nuclear missile submarine, because he has a terrible lot to think about when you consider that his cargo of missiles will probably take out, what, 20 million people? Um, and he's got to consider that, and he may develop, uh, as a result of that, a rather aggressive personality. He may feel that people ought to get out of his way. And uh, if he is making passage, and if he can make life unpleasant enough for trawlers in the middle of the Irish Sea, maybe they'll go away and trawl inshore. Trawlers rarely see submarines. For security reasons, they'll only surface when absolutely necessary. Admiralty charts show three submarine exercise areas in the Irish Sea. Mariners are warned when an exercise will happen, and the charts tell them to keep watch. Not much use if the submarines have dived. They just seem to stamp submarine exercise area over various parts of the chart and don't define the limits of the area, don't define the area. They actually tell you in the notice to mariners that because it's defined as a submarine exercise area, that you can expect to see submarines exercising outside it. So that means nothing. The submarines could be anywhere. When exercises are held, they are declared so that everyone who is likely to be sailing in that area has the, uh, has the facility to learn about the, the exercises, the areas in which they're going to happen, the timing of the exercises. It's the responsibility of the person who is going to be sailing through to find out what's going on and to keep out of the way. I think they're very, very cynical that uh, Whenever you would ask them about submarines and submarine activity, they don't ever volunteer any information, incidentally. If they're sending, if they're exercising submarines or sending them out, they never get in touch with us and say, hey, boys, would you watch that deep water channel for a bit because there's submarines in it? We never get any notice. Um, the, and when you do ask them questions, they just generally come back with the same response, which is we don't discuss with anybody the activities of our submarines. This secrecy has heightened the concerns of people like Bernard Moffat, who's worried about a whole series of incidents. One such case is the Marielle, a Scottish boat which was lost mysteriously with all five hands. It was, uh, it was fishing in Manx waters and it disappeared in um, calm seas off the southeast of the Isle of Man. Now, uh, as a result of our inquiries into that and pressure on the uh, Department of Transport, after the wreck had been discovered, um, a videotape was taken off the wreck. Royal Naval Divers made this video of the wreck. The Department of Transport claims it proves the vessel's scallop trawl got tangled in a telephone cable on the seabed. When the crew of the Marielle lifted the trawl and cable, the Ministry says the combined weight capsized the boat and she sank at once. In a statement, British Telecom told us they agree with that story on the evidence they've seen. But secrecy breeds suspicion, and relatives of the Marielle's crew have contacted the Labour MP George Fuchs, who is now pressing for more information about this and other incidents. Well, what I have done is written to both the Secretary of State for Defence, George Unger, 
and the Transport Minister, John Moore. And I've asked them to look and see if there is a pattern emerging, some kind of common element, carry out a full-scale, uh, comprehensive and systematic investigation into all these incidents and try and find some way, uh, so, uh, some common element behind it, and then some way of minimizing uh, any danger that might be uh, being caused to fishing vessels as a result of submarine activity. I think, really, uh, you, we would find, if we, if we could see exactly what the procedure is, that there is definitely a procedure for dealing with incidents like this, and I think we'd find that there isn't a great deal of fuss made about the payment of compensation for wrecked fishing gear. The uh, question is, of course, whenever Whitehall says it wasn't a submarine, um, really, they can only say it wasn't one of ours. But they said it wasn't one of theirs to Ray McAvoy for two weeks before owning up. It took them 12 months before they came up with an offer of compensation. And then it was four years after that before I, I had to settle with, with compensation uh, uh, from the Ministry of Defence. Why was there that four-year delay? Well, I wasn't happy with the, with the compensation. I wasn't happy with the whole case, the way it was handled from the beginning. Like, I understood like, when they sunk the boat and it made liability that they'd, they'd have made me an offer within a couple of a weeks, not months. The sinking of the Sherelga aroused the hostility of the Irish government. It couldn't act alone, but lobbied an international body to try and separate trawlers and submarines. The IMO is based here in London. It's the United Nations of the high seas with influence but little direct power. After two years, its safety committee has only managed to draft a weak resolution. Uh, it, in effect, uh, uh, reminds uh, submariners of the uh, uh, the need to avoid uh, becoming entangled in the uh, fishing gear of fishing vessels uh, and uh, of the fact that the fishing vessels will be unaware of, their, of the presence of submerged submarines. It uh, recommends that the submerged submarines keep clear unless they are, of course, uh, disabled. That frankly doesn't say much, does it? It's almost just a, a reminder of what the situation mm -hmm. is. Uh, that is true, but uh, this is an area uh, in which um, I don't uh, personally think that uh, regulations uh, in the normal sense would do very much good. The uh, surface vessel has no idea as to whether or not there is a submarine there, and uh, the um, burden really is placed on the submerged uh, submarine to keep well clear of uh, fishing vessels. We believe that the IMO resolution should be beefed up, that um, it's not enough simply to request submariners and fishing vessel uh, masters to avoid each other, that certain areas should be designated as commercial sea fishery areas, particularly in uh, the Irish and Celtic seas, um, and that submarines should avoid those areas. Now, if they have to traverse the areas, they should do so on the surface. It's, it's a reasonable enough uh, request, I think. Ultimately, the IMO has no power to ensure fishermen's nets catch only what they're intended for. If the authorities can't regulate life in Submarine Alley, other people are quick to offer personal solutions. There ought to be some arrangement for separating the, the uh, submarine from the fishing boats, both in space and in time, to make sure that collisions are not likely to occur. And that can be done. They don't need to be exercising all the time, and they don't need to be exercising in large areas of the sea. And if some information was given to the fishermen and the fishermen's organizations about uh, exercises, I know that there are difficulties about secrecy, but if some information was given to them, I think the likelihood of clashes could be reduced. Well, I think there's a lot of things that could be done. I think the first thing that should be done is a meeting whereby we can get to meet these uh, submarine supremos to discuss with them our problems and see what suggestions we can come to uh, between us to uh, try and alleviate the problem. Uh, su uh, suggestions to minimize contact risk, and when we have got contact, some kind of way of getting through to the submarine. If that submarine, as we're told, is running on for three hours, unaware that he's towing a fishing boat and its gear behind him, it's a pretty crude instrument if, if that is to be believed. But if it is, then surely there's something that can be done where we can get in touch with the submarine or quicker contact can be made with that submarine. Three hours is too long a time. If we look at the movement, uh, the accord, if you like, between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, um, there is a certain amount of cooperation now over exercises and so on, and I think provided that uh, 
uh, neither side's ability to operate in the in the oceans off the world is affected. The, any restriction that's applied, say, in the Irish Sea, where it's obviously necessary, the, 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 it should be able to be the basis of an accord through the IMO. It's, it's no problem, really. But the answer is quite simple. But I, frankly, I very much doubt if any politician has the, the intestinal fortitude to do what is required. But it would be quite simple to solve. All you'll have to do is to lay a small area of, of bottom mines. And if you do that and you warn people that bottom mines are laid in such an area, then any submarine making passage has two options. He can go through on the surface, in which case no problem. Uh, but if he goes through dived uh, and you, care to, you use sensor, sensor, sensor microphones to hear him going through and you care to activate the mines, well, obviously, when they've lost one submarine, they're not going to be mad keen to run the passage again. It's an extraordinary attitude for a submariner to suggest mining against submarines rather than uh, perhaps keeping the fishermen out. Well, I don't, think that, I don't think you've got any right to keep the fishermen out. So, and as I say, the answer is quite simple. Um, but uh, it's the only answer that I can think of. Mines. Might. Yeah, bottom mines. Extreme, perhaps, but there's nothing to stop submarines continuing to catch trawlers beyond the skill of the submariners themselves. That's been found wanting in the past and may be found so again. The patience of fishermen is running out. For the secrecy of the government, it's a lot of nonsense. One's watching the elite cotton mouse and it's really a lot of nonsense. Don't see there's any need for that. Sure, they've got intercontinental ballistic missiles and, and all that gear. I don't think the they really need to be going up and down the RDC. What do you think they should do about it? I think, uh, that's what, could you tell us that? Is there anything that they can't do about it, like? Where are we going to go? If we leave that area with no other place to fish, we're confined to a small enough area as it is. These fellas, there's plenty of deep water in the, in the, the Mid-Atlantic. West of Ireland, all they got to go is west of Portuguese Bank or up west of Hebrides, and they'll get as much water as they want. 